Hey folks, welcome to the Inductive Fallacies Lecture. And um, in this lecture, we're obviously going to be dealing with uh, the Inductive fallacy section of the reader. And we already learned last time that fallacies are mistakes in reasoning. And relevance fallacies are fallacies in which the premise is not relevant to the conclusion. And now we're dealing with fallacies that may have relevance between premise and conclusion but there's not enough evidence or the evidence provided is biased or weak or um, in some other way uh, just biased basically. So here we go with inductive fallacies. Now um, you can see here there's quite a few, a few more than last time, although last time we had all the variations on the appeals to emotion. Uh, I'm not going to go over, over every one here, but you've already seen um, the hasty generalization and generalization from exceptional case when we talked about chapter four and the samples. Um, those are basically weak or biased sample arguments. Uh, and then um, there's a few others. You may have heard there's some famous ones here like the slippery slope and the false cause, appeal to authority and popularity. Um, so let's go through these one by one. And I'll provide examples along the way. So before though we do that, one of the things I like to do is um, provide my own argument for the importance of doing this, and I think it's only fair that as a professor of a class where I'm asking you to uh, assess your own reasoning and the reasoning of others, that I provide you my own reasoning and give you my own justification um, for why we're, why we're here. So I would present a three-premise argument um, as to why we are continuing to study fallacies, and really this is a justification for this whole class. First. Generally speaking, humans aren't very good at reasoning, just naturally. That includes me and you and everyone else. Um, we need other people to help us and remind us that we're biased. That's actually one of the points of peer review in science is to cut down on human bias, even in scientists who are highly educated. Uh, so it's hard to disagree with that premise. Um, secondly, the whole point of this class is to make you better at reasoning. Right? That's ultimately what I've been arguing to you through this whole class. And fallacies are specific examples of bad reasoning, and they're everywhere. They're in us, they're in other people. So these three reasons together um, lead to the conclusion logically that learning to recognizing fallacies um, is likely to make you commit them less often and to become a better reasoner. Right? So the point of the class isn't to make you perfect. Right? I'm not going to use the perfectionist fallacy on my own class. Uh, because we're always going to be somewhat emotional as humans. We're always going to be somewhat biased. We're always going to have our favored positions and, you know, somewhat use the confirmation bias. The best we can hope for is to minimize our errors in reasoning, to make ourselves a little bit more open-minded, um, and ultimately become better reasoners incrementally. So, uh, ultimately, that's what the point of this class is, and that's what that argument there um, is arguing for. So the hasty generalization. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time here because, like I said, we already covered this one before. Uh, this basically is taking not enough apples out of the barrel, going back to the barrel of apples example. Um, and the most common pernicious form of this is anecdotal evidence. And uh, again, not going to say too much here, but um, it's obviously okay to have your own anecdotal evidence and to have stories that you tell people but it becomes a fallacy when you overgeneralize and you say, my story is true, so it's true for everyone, or you suggest that it applies more broadly than other people. Um, I did really crappy in this class, so everyone else is gonna have that same experience, or vice versa, for instance. So that's the anecdotal evidence. It's your generalization. Um, now, I'm just gonna present this to you guys because it might help you understand the hasty generalization more uh, but I also think it's actually a very interesting question about human nature. So uh, I present this free write as a free write to my face-to-face -face classes. I'll just present it to you guys, and then if you want to think about it more, you can. And so, so let's let's just first remember that prejudice, racism, technically speaking, these are forms of hasty generalization usually where somebody is saying is making overgeneralized traits of a particular race or category or group um, whether it's African Americans or Jewish people or whoever uh, and so one could argue that the reason people make hasty generalizations 
just has to do with their limited experience, right? Is that what leads them to make these hasty generalizations? They grow up in an insulated community where they don't tend to see too many people who are different, and the only people they know who are different have certain characteristics, so they overgeneralize from those few that they know of that race or, or culture. Is that the case? Or is it some deep-seated, you know, really deep prejudice that uh, goes beyond reason on some level? Right? So in other words, if we could expose everyone to more cultures and more people and better reasoning, would we see less, you know, fewer hasty generalization fallacies? Or are, is it so deeply ingrained to have a fear of the other that it's actually almost, you know, just so deeply uh, visceral that it doesn't even touch on human reason at all? Uh, and I really don't know about the answer to this question. I, I do know that there's evidence that people who are exposed to new things that they haven't been exposed to over time become more tolerant. Um, you know, from homosexuality to Christianity, whatever the thing you're not used to is. Um, but like I said, this is just a question to think about. So I wish I had a good answer. Okay, so the generalization from an exceptional case, uh, we haven't confronted directly, so I'll say a few things about this. This basically is, um, happens when we take a biased sample rather than a sample that's too small. Um, I mean, in a sense, it's small too, but it's also biased. So we take, we, we pluck from a sample, from a sort of uh, part of the sample that is not representative. It, it would be like if we took the only green apple in a barrel of, you know, otherwise red apples. You take, and, and then you take that one that's not representative and you pretend that it's representative. So that's a generalization from an exceptional case. Uh, sometimes this is, we call this the self-selection fallacy. Uh, because sometimes people will purposely select uh, parts of the population that support their research, that support their conclusion. So a common generalization from an exceptional case is made by college students, and we hear it all the time, and that's, well, Bill Gates didn't go to college, and he's successful, so why do I need to go to college? Eminem didn't do, you know, Eminem got recognized, and, you know, he was poor, so I can, I can get recognized too. Now the problem with this one is, no one's saying you shouldn't follow your dreams and work against the odds, but to say that Bill Gates is representative right, is just wrong. He's not representative. He's one of the rare people who was, didn't go to college, was extremely bright, and was also extremely successful despite not having gone to college. Um, so he's not a representative of the whole. He's more like the green apple in the barrel of apples. Um, so anytime we take one single person and we justify a uh, conclusion from it, um, it's going to be a biased sample, a generalization from exceptional case. So anyways, so I just wanted to quickly give you an example here of um, uh, the difference between a biased sample and a self-selection. So you can see in the first one, um, it's biased because they took a survey of anti-gun people um, and it seems like they're just using that survey, right? It, it doesn't seem like there's a deliberate selection. However, in the second one, I wanted to see how many people believe in God, so I talked to all the people in my church, and they all believe in God. I sent out a survey to my religious friends, so most people do believe in God. In this case, the sample's biased, but it's also self-selected, because the speaker went around to different people um, that he knew purposefully, it seems, to get that result. Uh, so. They're both very similar, but I just wanted to show you that kind of subtle difference in the self-selection. In a self-selection fallacy, there's more evidence that the speaker deliberately did it, rather than just, in some cases, the speaker may have actually just selected a sample without thinking as much about it. Okay. The accident. So the accident is a little tricky to recognize, so I definitely recommend doing all the exercises, as always, but. Um, especially to go through and, and s distinguish the hasty generalization from the accident. Because the accident basically is kind of like the opposite of a hasty generalization. And what I mean by that is that a hasty generalization generalizes inappropriately. It goes from the smaller part of the pie to the larger part of the pie inappropriately. Whereas an accident specifies inappropriately it goes from the large amount of the pie to the small amount of the pie 
inappropriately. So in an accident, it's more like a statistical syllogism that fails. Remember the statistical syllogism? Most X's are Y's, this is an X, so this is a Y. Coming to a specific conclusion, it's more along that pattern of reasoning that somebody creates an accident. Uh, so for instance, here, in the example, in America, we have the right to bear arms, right? So it starts with a broad claim about people having this right broadly. So if I want to point a gun at a police officer, I should be able to do so. But then it takes that broad rule and it applies it to a specific case to which it doesn't apply, right? It doesn't fit. You can't connect having the right to bear arms to being able to point a gun at a police officer. Having the right to bear arms extends very broadly, but there are still limits where it doesn't apply to. Uh, so this is an accident because it accidentally applies a general rule to a case that it doesn't fit. And again, notice how that's the reverse of the hasty generalization, which applies a false generalization from a specific claim that is not justified. Okay, so let's move on to a few more fallacies and then do a few more examples. The weak analogy. So we already talked about arguments by analogy. And basically, the weak analogy is just a bad, bad argument by analogy, that's all. So that's the nice thing about a lot of these fallacies is that you're not so much learning anything new about the form of the argument. You're more just learning about um, how that argument fails. That's what these fallacies are. A lot of times they connect to the previous argument forms we've studied. So anyways, uh, basically when you have a good argument by analogy, you have strong comparisons. Um, and when you have a bad one, you have bad comparisons. So to just take a really obvious, terrible example, if someone said, going to Southwestern College is like being in prison. After all, both the campus and the pri prison are buildings constructed by humans. That's such a superficial similarity between two buildings that it doesn't really tell us anything about one being like the other. Um, you'd have to make more uh, stronger similarity, a stronger case for the similarities between a college like Southwestern and a prison to make that argument work. So as, it's, as, it, as it is now, it's just a really weak analogy and does not even reach the level of an argument. Okay, untestable explanation. This basically, this fallacy basically comes from vagueness. So it gets its power from vagueness uh, and ambiguity. Um, if you don't clarify the terms in your argument enough, it, it might lead someone to wonder, is it even po does this even make any sense? Is it even possible to test for this on any level? Um, and sometimes you, know, you might hear phrases like in that example there on the PowerPoint, she has good vibes. What does it really mean to have good vibes? I mean, first of all, somebody might have good vibes to one person, but another person might get different vibes from that person. Uh, so I think to clarify, th this is when it helps, and if you're ever writing an essay, this is something to think about. Clarify what you're saying. What does good vibes really mean? Uh, are you saying that she smiles a lot? Is that the idea, that Charlene smiles more and she's more you know, happy? Well, then that would be a more specific, different claim. right? Then you'd say, um, She's good at helping people because she's always so upbeat and smiling all the time. Right? That's, that's already more specific. Uh, so untestable explanation happens when we have a claim in our argument that just isn't specific enough. It doesn't, nobody even knows what you really mean by it. So equivocation is another fallacy of language in that it focuses on the ambiguity of language use. Um, and basically what happens in equivocation is somebody slides between two different definitions of a word and uh, they don't make it clear that they're doing that. Um, and once we realize that the word is being used in two different ways in the argument, the whole argument kind of falls away. So in the common example here, sometimes people will say evolution is only a theory just like the theory that God created the universe. However, this argument uses the term theory in two different ways. When we talk about theory in terms of God, that actually is more of a, um, an idea or a hypothesis that different people have had over time about, yeah, I think God you know, probably created us and 
uh, it hasn't been tested or peer reviewed or anything like that. It is a theory in the more colloquial everyday sense, which is totally fine. However, in the scientific sense, a theory like the theory of evolution or the theory of gravity has a much more specific meaning. It means actually closer to fact, right? which is actually uh, one of the confusions here. Um, it starts as a theory that is a broad, more of a broad colloquial idea, but over time it gets tested again and again. More smart people try to prove it wrong and it doesn't get proven wrong. And even though we started out calling it a theory, we continue to call it a theory after it's basically been proven. Uh, and that's what's happened with evolution and gravity. We still, I mean, think of gravity. We still call it the theory of gravity, but nobody denies that that's true on some level, that, that gravity exists. And I mean, we build buildings based on our understanding of those laws. I mean, so uh, this argument misuses the term theory and doesn't clarify that it actually has a different meaning in science than it does in everyday life. Uh, I mean, in science, a theory involves peer review, uh, significant evidence, deductive and inductive arguments, mathematical equations and logic. Um, again, people trying to prove it wrong over and over and over. It involves a number of different angles as to that helps determine the theory is true or false. When you just have an everyday colloquial theory, none of that is present. So it's very different. Um, so that, that's an example. I actually saw a friend of mine on Facebook use this fallacy the other day. Uh, and he, I think he was just trying to be funny, um, but he said something like, as people become uh, more educated, they become uh, more liberal or something like that. As people become, to get more liberal education, they become more politically liberal. First of all, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's true, but secondly, there is an equivocation between liberal education which is an education that is broad and has a lot of different um, perspectives versus political liberal, which actually has different meanings depending on the country. A political liberal, for instance, in Europe and someplace like Britain would have slightly different values than a political liberal from the United States. So um, again, I think my friend was just having fun with the post and trying to start controversy for fun because that's kind of what you do on Facebook sometimes. But at the same time, there did seem to be a sliding of the definition of liberal, which would have been an example of equivocation. Okay, the slippery slope. So the slippery slope is a fun one because it's what our many of our parents said to us anytime we went outside in the cold when we were young. Oh, you're going to get pneumonia and then you're going to be in the hospital and I'm going to be visiting your grave. And um, it's the one thing leads to another fallacy. If this thing happens, this other thing will happen, and this other thing will happen. Now, I want to clarify, just like with some of the other fallacies, there's a subtle difference between saying one thing will lead to another legitimately, and one thing will lead to another and another illegitimately. So it's only a slippery slope if the things being led to are ridiculous and exaggerated, if they just go totally too far. Um, so, for instance, I'm going to give you an example of an argument that seems like a slippery slope, but is not, and then an actual slippery slope. And here it is. So the first one says, don't keep smoking like that. If you smoke over a pack a day, it can lead to lung cancer. That is an argument, because clearly there is a link between smoking a lot and lung cancer. And it doesn't even say will lead, it says can lead, right? It's even more a better argument because it allows for the possibility that there are some exceptions. So that first passage there, very clearly an argument, even though it still takes the form of A will lead to B, right? One thing will lead to another thing. The second one, on the other hand, starts the same way, but gets to a ridiculous conclusion, right? The ending being you'll be a junkie and dead before your 25th birthday. That's what distinguishes a slippery slope from an argument. Both cases, the arguer says one's going to lead to another. But only in the second case is that second thing so exaggerated that it would be considered a fallacy. So try to understand those subtle differences for the assessment. False cause. So the false cause, also known as correlation isn't causation, um, which is a little more descriptive. Uh, is actually perhaps one of the most common fallacies, in my opinion, maybe more common than the ad hominem. Uh, I see this cropping up again and again and again, 
uh, people failing to realize that just because two things are correlated or related in time in some way doesn't necessarily mean one thing causes the other. Right? So just to take a simple obvious example, uh, every time, you know, uh, let's say your daughter, you have a daughter, every time your daughter brushes her teeth at night, her hair is growing longer, right? It's just her hair is growing, people's hair grows. But it doesn't mean when she's brushing her teeth, it's causing her hair to grow. They're just happening at the same time. Um, I mean, every time I wake up in the morning, the sun is sort of rising as I'm starting my car. That doesn't mean that one is related to the other, that either the sun rising is causing my start a car, a car to start or vice versa. So there's lots of stuff that happens in the world, but whether something causes something else is a much more complicated um, process. And when I talk about this fallacy in my face-to-face -face class, I actually have my students reflect on how is a cause discovered in science. And it's usually pretty interesting because there's so many different answers and we all realize at the end that it ain't easy to figure out a cause. Right, so even just to figure out you know, one basic scientific law, if it's caused every time, if, if the same effect is resulting from the cause, we have to do multiple repeatable experiments over and over to verify that connection. Um, so it's not easy to figure out causes. The reason this is a fallacy is that the, the speaker pretends it's easy. They say, oh, these two th things are kind of correlated. Well, they're probably caused totally different things to say something's correlated versus something's caused. You can even see this in your own experience. Have you ever eaten something that you, you, know, you felt sick the next day and you weren't sure what you ate that made you sick? You can often figure it out by um, eliminating what you normally eat. Or you can say, well, I always eat pizza and I ate pizza yesterday, that didn't cause the problem. And you start thinking about what you ate, and then you're like, well, I had this burrito that had this, like, um, you know, particular type, let's just say cod fish in it or something. You're like, I don't usually have cod fish, so maybe that was what caused me to get sick. And let's say you don't think about it, and then another time you just kind of by accident, you have some cod, you're at a dinner and you have some cod fish, and you get sick again. And now you can say, wait a minute, in both of those cases, cod, I was sick and cod was related to it. So in other words, in both cases, cod was correlated with your sickness, but it was only on the second time that you started to think maybe there's a causal relation here. So that just shows you that it takes time before you can even determine if there's a relationship beyond correlation between two things or two events. So we can fail to appreciate um, uh, causation in this way in a number of dimensions, and that's what those variations are. Sometimes we may just be overlooking a coincidence, right? Two things are just happen to be related, like the girl's hair growing and the brushing of the teeth. Uh, there are other times where we're actually looking later in the causal process, but really there was a common cause that led to both of them. So, so for instance, um, let me give you an example of that last one. A common cause. Chimney fires and long underwear perches increase in frequency at the very same time. Therefore, chimney fires cause people to buy long underwear. So in other words, people are lighting fires in their fireplace and people are buying long underwear um, at the same time. They're correlated. So chimney fires are causing the purchases of long underwear. Or there's a common cause beneath both of those, which is cold weather. Maybe it's cold weather that's leading to the chimney people to light chimney fires and buy warmer clothes. Right? So there's other cases where we can misinterpret the causal process to begin with. Another very common um, one is the regression to the mean. So, so here's the problem. So look at that. Let, let's start with that chart. Um, everybody, when they perform at any game or any um, activity, we can tally up statistics of their performance, right? We can see how often they do this, how often they do that. And obviously, people have been doing that with sports for many years. So there's a tally of how many points LeBron James makes and his averages and so forth. And over time, these averages emerge. And we see that, roughly speaking, LeBron James is on this trajectory. But sometimes he does better and sometimes he does worse. He has bad games, he has good games. But in the end, there will be a mean um, pattern that emerges over time. And anybody who studies statistics and is looking at the statistics of a sports team or organization will see these means and differences.
In fact, to some extent, this is what the movie Moneyball was about, if anyone's seen that. Um, but the point is, is there's, an, there's a mean. Now, what we f often forget is that when somebody does poorly or does well, they're eventually going to revert back to their mean performance at some point. They're going to have good games, they're going to have bad games, but ultimately it's going to come to some, over time, it's going to come to some mean performance. The, what, where regression from the mean gets its name is that we fail to appreciate that it regresses to the mean, and we assume there was some cause there. So, for instance, um, now I know this example doesn't relate to LeBron, so just take that in mind. In this example on the PowerPoint at the top there, it says, the girls were well below their average on Monday, so I made them do, two, do 50 sets of push-ups. Guess what? Their average was much better on Tuesday, much better on Tuesday. Push-ups did the trick. So this, a co this coach in this case, in this example, fails to appreciate regression to the mean because he assumes that it's him having them do their push-ups that led them back to do better. But they had already been at a low point, so they were gonna just statistically regress to the mean and come back up to a higher point no matter what. So the push-ups probably didn't have any effect at all. Uh, so this coach failed to appreciate that regression to the mean. Um, so it often happens in the case of sports that we, we fail to appreciate that. But that's just one of the many ways that we can fail to understand causality. The bottom line is, just because two things are correlated in time, doesn't mean they're causally related. It doesn't mean one causes the other. Okay. A bit, just a couple more, and we'll do a couple more examples. So the appeal to authority, um, this is another one where it's tricky because there are legitimate appeals to authority and there are illegitimate ones. So much like with the ad hominem, we can be skeptical of people um, or, or we can be more open to people with particular degrees or have particular authority, but we should still mainly focus on their argument, right? The, the fact that they ha are an authority figure or have some reward or degree, it's a bonus, it's nice, because it suggests that they might be more likely to um, have something good to say, but it shouldn't be a determining factor. So the appeal to authority happens when we make it the determining factor. We say, this guy is really smart, whatever he says goes. Like this, And obviously we're not always going to say it that directly. It, it, it often happens more subtle ways. For instance, when we have people we very much respect, like our parents and our uh, people who have really guided us and developed our morals and values. Uh, I mean, come on, think about it. If you really respect your dad or mom, it's sometimes hard when you, you have a disagreement with them. It's hard to oppose them. Um, and in some cases, it's hard to ever think they're really wrong. And that's a real problem with, with authority. And this can happen with not just parents, but it, it does happen with academics where maybe you studied with someone you really, really respect and um, it makes you makes it harder for you to challenge things they say that might actually be mistaken or, or need revision. So um, let's look at in this example on the PowerPoint of a legitimate use of authority versus an illegitimate use. The first one says, my, my smart friend says Obamacare is bad for the country, so he must be right. So of course here we have the authority of a friend you really like and look up to being uh, substituted, uh, substituting reason. And the second one, the Pope said evolution is true, so evolution must be true. It doesn't matter what the Pope says. Uh, again, it might help that uh, a great man like the Pope believes something, but ultimately um, we want to look at independent reasons why that thing is true, not just because the Pope said it. Uh, so here's an example of an appeal to authority, a legitimate use of authority, which would be an argument, versus an illegitimate use of authority, which would be the fallacy. So the legitimate use is in that first passage. My professor has a PhD in economics, so his ideas about the TARP bailout should be considered. The TARP bailout is the 2008 bailout when the market crashed. Um, and if somebody has a doctorate in economics, that is a good reason to consider their ideas. This is why the first one, the first passage is a legitimate use of authority. But in the second case, we have the person saying, so what he says about global warming is true. 
So first of all, economists don't have their expertise in global warming. They might have some expertise about the influence of global warming on the economy, but you would want a climate scientist, right, to, to be more related to um, the topic of global warming. So right away, his doctorate isn't even in the right area in the second passage. But also, um, they clearly, the speaker just says, so what he says is true. They don't say we should consider it. So those subtle differences really make a big difference. They're subtle, and yet they're big in terms of what the argument is being presented. Right? Just to say we should consider the ideas, that turns it into an argument from a fallacy. It's a fallacy when we completely reject something, when we completely believe something. Um, it's okay to have authority figures. It's okay to... Um, be skeptical of someone who seems weird uh, in whatever way. Um, but it's not okay to fully reject their ideas, at least logically speaking. The appeal to popularity. Um, so, you know, this one's sort of obvious in a way. It, it gets its power from that common phrase, If well, if Jimmy jumped off a bridge, would you? This is what a parent is supposed to say when the kid says, hey, all my friends have the new you know, Xbox One, why can't I have it? Or whatever the new system is that they want. And then the mother says, or father says, well, if all your friends wanted to jump off a bridge, would you? And the idea, which is valid, which is legitimate, is of course that just because other people do something doesn't mean it's right or true. Just because lots of people believe something doesn't mean it's right or true. Uh, you know, sometimes you see people say this about God. Well, lots of people believe in God. How, how could it not, there not be some truth to it if 95% of the world believes in God? Um, now, I'm not saying anything about whether God does or doesn't exist, but let's just be honest. It's perfectly possible that there's a mass illusion. It's per there have been mass illusions in history where almost all of Europe believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Right? It was just a mass illusion to the point where people like Galileo and Perker Copernicus were persecuted for even suggesting something different. Uh, so there's perfectly possible that we could have a mass illusion. Just because people believe something, even most of the world, does not mean it's true. Um, and then there's a variation on this, which refers more to a practice than um, a belief. And you can see that in this one, right? Um, Don't object to me. Men in our family have always joined the military. Instead of giving a reason um, why you should join the military, like, well, you know, you serve your country, you, uh, you'll be a better person, you develop character, the father in this case seems to just say, hey, everyone's done it, it's a common practice in our family, so you should do it. So that alone wouldn't be a good reason why to do or not do something. And just to give you a historical example, um, going back to the point I made before, uh, Aristotle this actually shows the problem with appeal to authority and appeal to popularity. Because, first of all, the, the church fathers who had read a lot of Aristotle, um, both Muslim and Christian in the Middle Ages, they respected him so much. Aristotle, if you don't know, was an ancient Greek philosopher who was very influential on our culture. Um, and anyways, those medieval Christians and Muslims respected Aristotle so much that anybody who questioned his model of the universe, which you can see here, um, was often labeled a heretic, or they were often said, who are you to question the great authority, Aristotle? In other words, they used the appeal to authority. Uh, and you can see from this model how clever Aristotle was, but he's completely wrong. Right? The sun is not revolving around the earth. Um, there are more planets than are depicted there. There aren't these vibrating spheres that he thought there were. Uh, so that shows how the danger of the appeal to authority, but also the appeal to a popularity. Because once it was accepted, then everybody started believing it, and it couldn't be questioned. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples, and just kind of hone in your thinking, home in your thinking on the uh, previous fallacies we covered since the last example. So the weak analogy, undestable explanation, slippery slope, false cause, and then authority and popularity. So again, I recommend pausing now and taking a few minutes to determine which fallacies the categories fit there, which categories those passages fit, if any. Okay, so the first one, I strongly oppose the sale of alcohol at um, county golf course. The idea of allowing people to drink wherever and whatever is disgraceful. It can only lead to more alcoholism, drunk driving, perverted parties, and who knows what else. 
So this seems to be a pretty textbook example of um, slippery slope, right? They're saying that uh, um, allowing people to do something basic, drink on this golf course, is going to lead to some severe outcomes. And he needs to provide more evidence, the speaker does, that there is a connection between those two, that just allowing the drinking of alcohol is necessarily going to lead to perverted parties and who knows what else. Right? So the speaker starts with something more innocent uh, and leads to something more uh, exaggerated. So we'd call that a slippery slope. Second one, what's all the fuss? Everyone has done it. Why should you care if one more person does it? Another textbook example of popularity. It doesn't even say what it is, but it's of course a reasoning process we've heard at some point in our lives um, or been aware of somehow. Um, everyone's doing it, right? So what if one more person does it? Still wouldn't make it right. What if that thing is murdering people? <laughs> what if the author is like, hey, come on, everyone in the room has murdered someone else. Come on, just kill one more person. I mean, just if, if something is wrong to do or you shouldn't do it, doing it one more time or the fact that others are doing it isn't a good justification uh, for doing it. And then finally, uh, we have a weak analogy. Now, I bet some of you guys were thinking hasty generalization for a second. Now, the first thing I'd say is, remember, hasty generalization was not an option. But even if it was, weak analogy would be a better option. And that's probably because some of you are misunderstanding what generalize means. Sometimes we take the term generalize and we just basically say it means something bad. Right? We're just like, oh, dude, you insulted me. You're kind of generalizing. Generalizing has a specific meaning. It means you take something smaller and you draw a conclusion about something bigger from that small part, right? the sample. You take a sample and you generalize to a broader thing. What's happening in that passage about the Sun and Boy Scouts is not a generalization from a smaller thing to a large thing. It's a comparison of one thing to another. That's why it's a false analogy because it's a comparison of one son to another son. It's not a general, you don't generalize from one person to another, you compare. You generalize from one person to many people. So just trying to help you understand a, a common error that people in general make regarding generalizations. Uh, so once again, that is a weak analogy because it assumes that her son or his son, whoever's making that argument, is like the son of somebody else. But it doesn't stipulate any other similarities, so It'd be a weak analogy. For all we know, the other son is completely anti things like Boy Scouts and um, has very different interests. Okay, so the next thing I want to do uh, before we wrap this up is I just want to take a couple cases of turning a fallacy into an argument because uh, I know that's because, that, like I said, that's a big part of this whole these last two chapters, and it's also um, going to come up on the assessment. So let's look at this example. We have this classic exceptional case fallacy about Bill Gates. Bill Gates didn't go to college, and he's a millionaire, so college is a waste of time. So once again, it's an exceptional case fallacy because it takes an exceptional case that is Bill Gates and generalizes about all of college for everyone, uh, when in fact most research suggests that you will actually um, make more money and, and um, raise your social standards and uh, raise your, your class, really by going to college. Right? So we can't take one person and generalize about all college from that. That's why it's a fallacy. However, we could make up some numbers. Because remember, when you're creating these arguments, I'm asking you to think of what it would take to make it an argument. What other premises could we add if we had them? And that means you can pull in from your imagination. What sort of study would it take? You can make it up so that it helps you determine what would make the argument stronger. And that's exactly what I've done here. So I made up two statistics. Two statistics. According to a study, 50% of currently employed people did not go to college. So right there I'm supporting the idea that college was a waste of time because lots of people didn't go to college. Also, another study showed that 60% of college graduates are unemployed. And then the second study shows that, well, wait a minute, if people went to college and they're not working, maybe it is a waste of time, right? So these are relevant premises now. And notice what I did for the conclusion. I, I made the argument stronger by saying, for some, college is a waste of time. 
because clearly even with those uh, numbers that I made up, there would still be a significant part of the po uh, portion of the population that is getting something out of college, right? 40%, 50%, um, respectively. Uh, so that's why I had to add for some. So this is something else to think about. When you're turning a fallacy into an argument, you can modify the conclusion as well um, to kind of fit better with the premises too. And there are cases when you can actually change the conclusion. Uh, your, your only task when you're turning a fallacy to an argument is to somehow take the framework of the fallacy and construct it into an argument and leave as much as you can. There might be cases where you leave the premise and other cases where you leave the conclusion. Okay, so let's look at this one. If I join a hiking club, the next thing you'll know, I'll be rock climbing and mountaineering and who knows what else. I've got too much to do to get into all that, so I'm not going to join a hiking club. Uh, so this is a bit of a um, slippery slope because who's to say that joining one club is going to necessarily lead them into mountaineering and rock climbing? Seems like a little bit of a stretch. Maybe not as bad of a slippery slope as some of the previous ones. But still, I mean, the speaker clearly has control over his own behavior. He's suggesting that if I do one thing, suddenly I'm going to start joining everything. Seems a little bit premature to go there. Uh, and it's not very good reason in any case for why he shouldn't join a hiking club. Um, so we have a slippery slope. To turn it into an argument, what I did was I listed out the, the conclusion with a few lines for premises. And I said, what would it take to give me a good reason to join a hiking club? what would good reasons be for one to join a hiking club? And I said, or sorry, for one not to join. I, for one, what would good reasons be against joining a hiking club? Why would one not want to join a hiking club? Uh, and one good reason would be, well, you don't like hiking. That's a very clear reason why you wouldn't want to join the club. You don't have much money for the fees that you have to pay. And you got too much to do, right? So I won't join a hiking club. Now, this is an argument now because we've provided more legitimate reasons. And notice there's no inappropriate generalizing or anything because the premises are about I, the person making the argument, and the conclusion is about I, the person making the argument. So we've now turned this into a more legitimate argument um, from a slippery slope fallacy. Okay, folks, I'm going to end that one there.